the intention that I have over the next few weeks regarding uh, this Christmas series is not to necessarily give you some warm and fuzzy feelings and stuff. That's fine. If you feel a fuzzy, if you feel a feeling, that's great. Um, there's uh, various ways that you can approach the Christmas message. You say, why are we going to do three weeks? Well, three weeks this way. My intention is to uh, pitch to you right down the middle. I want you to hit these pitches of truth and use them in your life leading up to Christmas. I mean, it's the word of God. You can use them forever. But I'm just going to, I'm just going to hereby declare all of you and myself, as Paul told Timothy, to be doing the work of an evangelist. Isn't that a great way that Paul said it? Timothy was not an evangelist. He was a pastor teacher. But Paul told Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Every believer is to do the work of the evangelist. Does anybody know what the evangelist does? They tell people the evangel, the gospel. And we're going to be looking a lot the next few weeks about the gospel and how you and I can be instruments of bearing uh, the message and the word of Christ. Christopher pops into my head. Christopher. If your name is Christopher, uh, like Christopher Columbus's parents named him Christopher because they dedicated him to the advancement of the gospel. I don't know if you know that or not, but in the writings of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Christopher Columbus, mom and dad, uh, that, that was their declaration. that they, they dedicated their newborn son to be one who takes the gospel uh, to the world, and that's why they named him Christopher. Christ bearer is what Christopher means. And so I want all of you to be Christophers, as it were, during this season. Uh, we approach this time of the year with all kinds of different things going on in life. Everybody does. Uh, but as we do, uh, this is a time for some people to take advantage of other people. This is a time for some people uh, to kind of bury their head in the sand for whatever reasons. Uh, There's some people who they, they lament the approaching of the holiday season, for fear of loss, pain. We understand that. And, um, but one thing is certain, that if you and I are drawing breath right now, we've got to mitigate and we've got to understand uh, the time and the age in which you and I live in right now. And um, uh, you guys probably well know that all around the world, Christmas is celebrated uh, more than any other holiday of any other faith or belief group in the world. It's fascinating. Even in Muslim nations, they celebrate Christmas, but they don't celebrate it with the same message that the Bible has to uh, proclaim, but they celebrate it. And that's uh, rather interesting. So listen, for these next three weeks, if you're taking notes, this is the series. You have to pay attention, though. The series is called His Return. You say, oh, this is going to be a prophetic teaching? Uh, it could be. Or maybe it is. Because when we talk about his return, we're actually talking about the fact that after God created everything, and after the fall of man, the word of God was constantly being produced outward from that epicenter of God returning and God redeeming. God returning and God saving. God returning and God establishing. So at the top of your notes, write down his return. That's what we're going to be looking at as a theme. Before we do this, I, I've got to work this in. And, and I don't tell jokes, but this is a cute joke that I'm stealing from um, J. Vernon McGee. And, um, and so I am reminded about this because Christmas time is a time of anticipation. It's also, if you have little kids in your life, it's a time of manipulation. <laughs> Let's be honest. And so, J. Vermeggie talks about the little uh, boy uh, who wanted a bike for Christmas, that he could hardly contain himself. And so he plotted, and he planned, and he schemed. He thought of everything he could to manipulate mom and dad into considering his request for a brand new bike. He felt that his request wasn't getting anywhere with mom and dad. Well, mom picked him up from school on the last day before Christmas break, but on their way home, she had to stop quickly uh, to pick up something at the local store. So as little Johnny sat there, he suddenly noticed on the dashboard was a statue of a Virgin Mary. 
then bam, he had the answer to his problem. He suddenly made the connection between Mary and Jesus being the son of God. And at that, he reached out and snapped Mary off the dashboard at the ankles. He stuffed her in his lunchbox, looked around, and then bowed his head in prayer and said, Lord, if you ever want to see your mother again, you'll get me that bicycle. <laughs> That's one way of anticipating a gift. But it's pretty amazing. When you talk about anticipation, you cannot have a title of this series, His Return, without thinking about it. Not only the advent of Christ 2,000 years ago, uh, the Bible tells us, we often forget this, that they were those who were actually looking for the coming of the Messiah. They knew the Old Testament, friends. Listen carefully. We often miss it. There's a man, we'll read about him later, Simeon. Do you remember the old man Simeon? He actually knew the scriptures, the Old Testament, and figured out that the Christ was about to be born. Wow, he was waiting. And the Lord had told him, you are not going to die until you see my salvation brought into the world. And that's why you read that tremendous account in the Gospels. As he holds baby Jesus, he says, that's it. Thank you, Lord. Now I can die in peace. Wow, anticipation. It's part of our human creation that God has put in us. Talk about anticipation. If I had to sum up the entire Christmas message into a few verses, it's this, believe it or not. It's John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. In the beginning, that is of the physical universe, was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. That's key. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. And the world became flesh, verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld, says John, his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Man, I'm telling you, if you want to sum up Christmas, that's it. That the word of God came into the world in human skin and revealed to us the very nature of God for our redemption. So church, as we look at our study today and for this season, I'm going to ask you to write it down. Number one is this. His return is the promise of his return breeds anticipation. The fact that it is the promise. Write that down. His return is a promise. The Christmas message is anything, friends. You've heard me say this recently. I'm going to really dial down on it in this season. The Christmas message is anything but a story. I just refuse to have it be addressed as a story. I know it's in the movies. I know it's in songs. I know it's in tradition, but it's not a story. In my opinion, stories are made up. All around the world, it's the greatest story ever told. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. The fact of the matter is the Bible declares that it's the greatest fact ever told. I don't care what you put up there. Say, oh, no, this was the greatest miracle. That was the greatest miracle. Even, you know, our salvation. Yes, yes, our salvation, yes. But wait a minute. The greatest, the greatest fact of all is not that God created the heavens and the earth. He could do that all day long. It's the fact that he came into the world that we call this Christmas. We're not pausing for a tradition. We are celebrating actual biblical truth and facts. As we look at Christmas, and I want to equip you over the course of these next few weeks, the greatest Christmas message of all is a missionary message for you and I to announce to the world that he has come and that he's come to rescue us and that he's come to redeem us. So number one, as we look at this, the promise of his return is this. It's a promise deeper than what we had thought. When you look around at all of the Christmas trappings and, you, and the, the nativity and the, the trees and the stuff, don't get caught up into it. Mark it down if you would. It's the greatest announcement of Christmas ever found in the Bible. And I wonder if you know where it is. It's Genesis 3.15, the very first Christmas verse. Did you know that? Genesis 3.15. By the way, are you guys, are you guys with me? Yeah. It's the first prophecy of the Bible. It's the first Christmas message of the Bible. It's the first evangelistic message in the Bible. It, in many ways, it's the first found right there in Genesis 3, verse 15. And here it is. And I, that is the Lord speaking, will put enmity between you, that is Satan, and the woman, that's Eve, and between your seed, 
that's always chilling. Satan has children. And her seed, notice in your Bible, it's capital S for a reason. Her seed, meaning women do not have sperm. There's something going on here that is absolutely divine. She doesn't have the, this uh, makeup. We're talking about a miracle announced regarding something. He, who's he? Whoever the seed is. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. A remarkable statement. When Jesus Christ comes into the world, when the promised Messiah arrives through the woman, he's going to crush the seed of the serpent. But the serpent, he will inflict a wound on the heel of the Messiah. That verse, friends, listen up, especially if you are viewing from the Middle East or especially if you're Jewish. Genesis 3.15, Moses is saying this. From the descendancy of Eve. Notice, he doesn't say Adam, does he? That's a whole Bible study in itself. It's huge. Jeconiah, Adam, the connection with Joseph, a carpenter. Mind-blowing. None of Joseph's blood could be in Jesus Christ, or else he could not be the Messiah. There's going to be enmity, warfare, between two warring, can I put it simply, two warring clans, two warring entities, darkness and light, death and life, Satan's desire to hold you bound and captured by your own sin, and God's desire to have you set free by the offering of his son. That in that verse is the promise, and my Jewish friends, listen, from that verse is an announcement that there'll be a man born from the descendancy of Eve, and he will have the power to destroy Satan, but he himself will be the great deliverer. Genesis 3.15. We can go home right now. Seriously, if you wanted to take the Bible seriously, Genesis 3.15 is enough for you to find the gospel and come to Christ right then and there. No doubt about it. See, friends, the reason why it's not a story. People think so, say so. No, nope. it's not a story, but it is a tragedy if you think about it, that man mankind was once perfect in this created state of life. Listen, mankind was created perfect. Some people have a hard time with that. doesn't matter. Because, you know, listen, some people say, I don't believe that man was created perfect because if he was created perfect, he wouldn't have sinned. Listen. Mankind was created perfect. Adam and Eve were perfect. It's no story, but it's a tragedy that you having a choice is God's embedded function of the human psyche. For you and I to actually be viable human beings before God in the area of making a decision, yes and no, Christ or not, God gave you a, I think it's supernatural. It's amazing. But God gave you this ability to say no to things and yes to things for choice. And yet, Adam and Eve had choice, and they were perfect. You wonder how long it lasted, though, you know? How long? It's not a story, but it's a tragedy that mankind would decide to ruin his own life and generations by his own choices. See, everybody's getting closer to home. Adam and Eve were created perfect. But God gave them the ability to choose. Why is everything so messed up? Because man makes his choices. And listen, you and I are no different than our original mom and dad, except we're fallen. We are fallen. God told them, the moment that you sin against me, you'll die. And they died spiritually. They lived on 900 more years, but they died spiritually. They exercised a choice and they went against the will of God. You say, how can they be perfect if they did the wrong thing? Ah, my friend, because perfect love is very risky and very dangerous. Perfect love. He loved us with a perfect love. And to do that, he engineered within us choice. To choose, to pick, to have the desire. Somehow, and we'll get this into the book of Romans after the new year. Think of this, that God somehow engineered within you the sovereign ability to choose and be responsible for those choices. That doesn't mean you're responsible for getting yourself into heaven. 
When you say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ, you are willfully responding to his offer. He made the provision. He paid the price. He calls it Christmas. He comes into the world to save all those who put their trust in him. He doesn't make you choose, but he gave you the choice to make the choice. He gets all the glory for providing the way out, but should you reject the Christmas message, all of the damnation, think about that, all of the condemnation comes upon the individual like Adam and Eve who rejected God's plan. They wanted to do it their own way. It's no story, but it is an ultimate act of mercy that mankind would be offered salvation at all. God did not have to do this. And according to the Bible, friends, God promised to return to his creation as its redeemer. Genesis 3.15, as I said. Also, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, mark this down. Remember, we're talking about it being a promise that is his return that's deeper than we had thought. Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this attitude, let this view, let this thought or the way of thinking be in you. Who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. This is amazing. Notice this. This is Jesus coming into this world. He comes in as a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Look, you and I are born in the likeness of men, because we had to be born in the likeness of men. He came here choosing to be born in the likeness of mankind. This is called Christmas. That's what he's doing. And became obedient to the point of death, even, the Bible says, the death of the cross. Verse 9, therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess. Oh, I hope your tongue has confessed this confession. That every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father and all God's people said. For you to make that confession is for you to say that I believe that God sent his promised one. His return was actually him not leaving us alone in Eden, vanquished by Satan and by our own flesh, but his return, we can at least talk to the point of him coming to a little town in Bethlehem. He returns. Can I put it this way? He returns to the scene of the crime. He comes back to earth where it all started. Having made it perfect, establishing Adam and Eve, They reject him. Instead of him writing at us, look, he could have bundled up our universe and just threw us out into oblivion. Did you know that? He could have. He could have just flicked us like that. He could have. He didn't. He returned to the scene of the crime to buy us back, to be our redeemer, to be the actual point to the Christmas story. Christmas story? Or Christmas fact. Oh, tell me the Christmas story. Look, if you want a story, read uh, Humpty Dumpty. (laughs) How about if we sit down with the kids and grandkids and read them some Christian facts? Or some Christmas facts? The second thing is this, is that it's a promise unique beyond all chance. (laughs) It's unique beyond all chance. The promise of his return... That as the weary world is being sustained by a breath, the meaning of the Christmas message, frankly, is impossible to miss, let's be honest, unless you're determined to miss it. Think about all that's going on around the world today. If you miss the meaning of Christmas, then that's something intentional. Because it doesn't take an Einstein to figure out, is it really about this fat guy with a red suit on? And the black boots and the beard, what's the story? Flying reindeer, what's the deal? What's with the tree? Say what? Why are we giving gifts to each other? What's this stuff all about anyway? You don't have to think too deep to discover all that stuff is fluff. There's something going on here. And it's real. And it's unique. There is no possible way outside of the Bible itself 
that anyone or anything at any time has ever announced that the promise of his coming is so absolutely unique, it's beyond chance. Unique because God had planned it 100%. I love this. God had planned it 100% from the very beginning. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. I, here it is. Isaiah 7. You're already getting Christmas cards with this on it. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, God among us. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, written 743 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, my friends. Every synagogue in the world had the book of Isaiah, the scroll of Isaiah. In fact, it was the book, Isaiah was the scroll that Jesus commissioned his earthly ministry with. Isaiah. It's this Isaiah. Can you imagine? Jesus in the flesh, Starting his earthly ministry, it's his day where as a male at a particular synagogue, every Sabbath, a, a male gets the reading of the scriptures. And on that day, Jesus receives the scroll from the attendant. The attendant would have had a mark of where all the synagogues in the world would be reading from that day. And here it is. Jesus stands up and says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Uh-huh, I just heard that collective. To, pre to preach glad tidings to the, you know the verse. And he, when the scripture says, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and there's a comma, and the day of his vengeance. Jesus stopped at the comma, right in mid-sentence. Everybody, the Bible says, their eyes were fixed upon him. He rolled up the scroll and handed it back to the attendants. And he said... Today, is this scripture fulfilled in your hearing? And that's the christening of the physical ministry of Jesus on earth. And from that moment on, for three and a half years, Jesus Christ fulfilled Bible prophecy after Bible prophecy. And the weary world rejoiced. Absolutely awesome. Beyond all chance. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born. No big deal. Children are born all the time. I just got a report from uh, one of our staff leaders. Pastor Jack, here's what's going on. This is where we're at, and this is looking ahead to the new year. And by the way, uh, we have really been fruitful and multiplying as a staff. And I said, I don't like the way that sounds. Coming from a business perspective, because we have to pay the light bill and stuff around here. What are you saying? Um, it means that all the young people on staff, um, you know, they've gotten married. Some, some of them have met each other here on staff, got married, and uh, making babies. They are. And so we got a bunch of babies that will be coming in 23, or 24, excuse me. And um, that's a very sweet thing, but a child is born all the time. That's no big deal for the spectators, you know? A child is born. If that prophecy ended there, people would have said, well, so what? Here's where it gets super interesting. A son is given. Say, what? A woman who has to be a virgin is going to be pregnant without intercourse, conceived of the Holy Spirit, and that child within her will be the creation of God. It will also be God's, the creator, God. Becoming like what he made. And he's going to be given. The word given implies offered. A, a child's going to be born. A son will be offered. Friends, listen. If you're a doubter in the Bible, it's time to stop. Whatever your excuse is, it's pathetic. The Bible is announcing right here. 743 years before Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem, that the one coming would be a child born. He's going to come as a child because a son will be the one that is offered up. He was born to die. Remarkable. The third thing under this point is this church. It's that it's a promise anticipating every human need. The fact that his return has been promised, it's promise is anticipating every human need. In Psalm 141, the Bible tells us, verse 1, Lord, I cry to you. Do you ever cry to God? 
Have you, been, have you ever been brought to that place? I'm not, I'm not talking about when things are fine. They, you know what? Anybody can be a Christian when things are fine. By the way, little insert, little... Don't panic when things in 2024 don't go according to schedule. They're going exactly perfectly according to God's schedule. It just all depends on which side you put your focus no, we don't know what's going to happen in 2024. Oh, yeah, actually, we kind of do. It's an election season. So I predict at least three super pandemic viruses. <laughs> Somehow all of them will be made in China. Maybe the last one won't be. Somehow that one might have, we'll have to change the location. But something's going to happen. There's going to be more BLM uh, breakout riding Antifa. There'll be some new stuff popping up on the streets to where it's too dangerous to vote. Can't go outside. Lockdown. Something. Think about it. I don't know. I don't care. Here's the deal. God's on his throne. Christ came. He's risen from the dead. And heaven awaits. Boy, did I digress from that verse. Lord, I cry out to you, make haste to me. Give ear to my voice when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Wow. Anticipating. Oh, God, I need help. Anticipation, listen, is, is a great thing in the midst of great need. Think about it, everybody. When things are fine, things are fine. But when you need help, anticipation's a big deal. You're anticipating this. Look, listen. Look, I'm older now, and I'm and I I I I'm I'm a I'm a horrific I'm an incurable saver. I, you know, listen. People walk by, and there's, there'll be a dime or a penny on the street, and I learned from the youngest of ages: grab it, if it, grab it. And then later, by the way, I found out later on when I grew up that Abraham. I mean. Um, Ben Franklin said, a penny saved is a penny earned. And I thought, oh, man, that guy thinks just like I do. (laughs) Grab that penny. I was told years ago, the reason why you should grab that penny and put it in your pocket and save it is because it says, in God we trust, which makes it priceless. So I've been hoarding pennies all my life, and then pennies, pennies accumulate over time. And now I'm old, and here's the thing. I'm not rich, but I'm not hungry. Are you hearing me? The moment, though, the moment I realize, hey, you know what? I don't have to go to work this week. It's trouble. And God, listen, God in his mercy will sometimes get our attention when the well dries up. And we got to go somewhere else to dig a hole. God is in that. I don't know how we're going to make it. Listen, it's tough because Lisa and I, we've been married forever and we've seen God do amazing things. So when young couples, they freak out. We don't know how this is going to happen. We remember that. And it's like, it's going to work out. And they think we don't care because we say to them, it's going to work out. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. Oh, brother. I knew you were going to say that. It's true. It's true. Anticipating Your next meal is not a bad thing. Most of the world has to anticipate their next meal. The moment we get all comfortable and velvety about things, our hearts can depart from God. Anticipation. Christ's coming anticipated every human need. And I'm not talking physical only, mostly spiritual 1 Samuel 16, verse 7 says, For the Lord does not see as man sees. Thank God. For man looks at the outward appearance. Do we not? (laughs) To the point of a fault. But the Lord looks at the heart. Wow. A friend of mine, I'm not going to mention his name, his pastor, he dressed up like a homeless guy. And he went and hung out in and around his church to see what people would do. And uh, after about a week of doing that, he preached the Sunday message. And uh, it was probably the best message he ever gave because he was so disappointed nobody from his church helped him out as a homeless person. (laughs) 
So he really let it have it, which might explain why he was removed. But anyway, um, <laughs> I thought that was quite a great move. He was just trying to make an illustration, a living parable. God knows the heart. In Luke chapter 2, verse 25, the Bible tells us regarding this great Christmas event that behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. We talked about him earlier. This man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Palestine. <laughs> of what? Israel. Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And, he had been, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. That's what Jesus' name means. Emmanuel, God among us, Jesus, Joshua, Yehoshua, Yeshua is salvation, God's salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all nations. That word peoples is nations. A light to bring revelation to the Gentiles. Say amen to that. Amen. Woo! Listen, that verse right there, tell your Jewish friends, I'm in on this. Yeah. Hey, Jesus may have come to Israel. But he's a light to the Gentiles. I qualify. Yeah. I can come to him. And I've come to him. Ask them, have you come to him? Have you come to your Messiah? Yes. It's thrilling. And the glory of your people Israel. Verse 33. And Joseph and his mother Mary marveled at those things which had spoken to him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel. This child will be a lightning rod. This child will be a point of contention. This child will be the source of division. Boy, you think about that. And for a sign which will be spoken against. That's why you hear Jesus' name as the most cussed, cursed, defamed name on the planet. It's remarkable. There is not a need in your life where God's consolation, God's comfort cannot come for you. And I wrote some thoughts down. People like, you know, if you Google this, there's, the, and the answers vary, but what is man's, what's man's greatest uh, need? And uh, it's, uh, you'll see things like this. And the order changes up. Uh, you, uh, Jack, you're crazy because how can God meet all of my need in Jesus, the Christmas Christ, uh, how, how does that play into me breathing air? I have to have air. Well, according to the Bible, he's the inventor of the air you're breathing. And if that's not enough, he's the inventor of your lungs and your heart and your entire human system that's processing the atmosphere around you. He's also invented the atmosphere you're breathing. Somebody might say, well, uh, the biggest need is for food. You got to have food. How does how does that how does that, how does this correlate to food? God invented food. Imagine not only God did God invented food, but the seeds He said are to produce after their own kind. An apple does not become a banana. Isn't that great? You like apples? Good for you. You like bananas? Good for you. Now Israel has tampered. This is not a joke. Israel actually made a banana apple. But they had to make it. They had to cross. The point is this. A banana will always be a banana. Who says? God says. And so does science. But food. Isn't it amazing that the, even the food colors, the color of food matters as to the season in which you should eat it. Now, we live in America. We're all messed up. You know, honestly, we eat foods at seasons where we ought not to be eating them. The way the world is supposed to work is that there's certain foods that grow at certain seasons in certain climates for certain people to live in those environments. It's amazing. But you know what? We have to have summer every day. 
so you can get watermelon 365. <laughs> but God made that, and he made your body able to process that. And somebody, it depends on where you look, what's at the top or what's in the uh, top three, is the sex drive, intimacy, closeness. Well, what does God have to do with that? Really? <laughs> Just check pl the plumbing. <laughs> God made it perfect. It works perfect. What's the chances of that? I don't believe in God. I think you need to take a look around. Because if you don't believe in God, then you're, you're, you're saying that life is an evolutionary accident, but you're going to have to have a male and a female in evolution mature at the exact same month, week, moment, in sexual maturity for a baby to be conceived. Just that fact alone makes evolution impossible. That takes more engineering than anything that this known universe could ever imagine. That is so cool. That is an amazing thing. Number two in our study, it's this. His return is the purpose of his return. The purpose the Bible says in Luke chapter 2, verse 6, and so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her, that's Mary, to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. I'm not going to get into the meaning of swaddling clothes. You can listen to last year's Christmas, but swaddling is what you wrapped the sacrificial lamb after it had been Approved of by the priest, you wrap the sacrificial lamb in swaddling clothes, the ribbons of cloth, so that that lamb, it's like bubble wrap. Think of bubble wrap. You can't have this broken or messed up with. So how are we going to ship it? Bubble wrap it. <laughs> We've got the lamb. How do we make sure between the lamb and the day of its sacrifice that there's no scratches and it doesn't break a bone? Bubble wrap it. And this wrapped in swaddling clothes, it was an announcement Nobody wrapped their kids in swaddling clothes in those days. But this is the Lamb of God, my friends, we're talking about here. And they laid him in a manger, a feeding trough, because there was no room for them in the end. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold... I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all nations, all peoples. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. See, it was unusual. Lying in a manger. The shepherds might have said, who does this? God does this. And suddenly there was with the angel... A multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Remarkable. It's a purpose. His return has a purpose, and it's to give answers. Him coming 2,000 years ago into this world answered the ancient prophecies. And by the way, his coming again will answer those same prophets in different chapters and in different books. Jesus is the answer. Makes for a great bumper sticker, but you know why? The Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Colossians 2, 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. This, that sounds like, the, that should be a warning on the curb of every university. There should be lights out in front. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, who? Who's the him? Christ, Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So what does that mean? The physical existence of Jesus Christ contained all the will of God wrapped in human skin. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit manifested to mankind through God the Son in the flesh. God came into this world 2,000 years ago to tell us, I know exactly how you feel. 
I'm the answer to every one of your issues. He says in verse 10, Colossians 2.10, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. That is awesome. What does that mean? It means Jesus Christ, Satan must bow, Michael must bow, Gabriel must bow, angels, demons must bow, all principalities. That's a reference to invisible domains and powers of a non-physical world. All are subject to Jesus. I love that. That ought to bump up the Christmas message on your estimation bar. This is the truth of it. It made me think of this. Oh, holy night. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. Is that beautiful? Wow. A thrill of hope. The the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. That's Bible doctrine, friend. That's just not a Christmas hymn. It reminded me, and I just, threw it, I just had to throw it into my notes. It's known as an American hymn, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, by the way. It says in the Battle Hymn of the Republic that we most often associate with the Civil War, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, as he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. That's one of the most beautiful statements you could make. We're all about love. Love. And by the way, this is what we're not about. One of the, one of the I was going to say stupid, but some people write me and say, don't say stupid. Like, I'm training my kid not to say stupid. I'm sorry. The dumbest thing. <laughs> dumb, dumb, dumb thing to say is vain philosophy and words of deceit. Love is love. You ever heard that before? Love is love. Seriously. Has anyone stopped to say, can you unpack that for me? Can you define that? That's a big statement. What does that mean? Friends, the fact of the matter is, love, according to the definition of love, gives your life for the one you love. That's Love is love. Love is not love. Laying down your life for someone is love. Loving God is love. Knowing that God loves you is love. Loving truth is love. Listen, loving him, loving one another, loving our enemies is love. Loving those who hate us is love. Love is love my foot. (laughs) Well, it has just about the same amount of logic and reason in it. No, the truth of the matter is, number two, in our second point, it's purpose that has a forever ending. I hope I I don't confuse you with this, but we have as believers a forever ending. And you say, what? Well, I'll have to explain it, and it may be a crummy analogy, but it's, it's a purpose that has a forever ending. This gospel, this life, this Christmas event. There are many varying emotions when you hear the word, the end, or... It's ending, or we've come to the end. It depends on the context, right? You might be at a movie, and you can't wait for it to end. You're like, man, when's this thing going to end? And for you, that's good news. Somebody might say, uh, oh, it's ending. It ended. What a great experience. That's fantastic. And the ending is actually wonderful because you can't live like that in a sustained state. It's enjoyed in seasons. And it's like, you know, like the Rose Bowl parade. Thank God it only goes on for one day. Can you imagine every day? If it went on for every day, nobody would go there. Oh, look, it's, here it is. It's the end. And it's like, that was awesome. Think about, listen, because of the Christmas message is true, the end for us is a forever ending, meaning that was great. What does that mean? When you and I come to the end of our lives in this world and we transition into his world, we're going to say, we will really say about this life lived here, that was great. In fact, according to the Bible, are we not supposed to have that attitude even now, if you think about it? 
all the stuff that's going wrong in this life, yes, there's horrible things happening, but Abraham said it this way, shall not the Lord of all the earth do right? Even in evil, God will use it. He says that in the end, I will glorify my name through evil. The sickness, the cancer, the pain, the breakup. God says, just hang on to me. Oh my goodness, friends, the worst thing you can do in the sickness, in the pain, in the cancer, in the breakup is to let go of God. That's suicide. Don't do that. If everybody's turned on you, turn to him. He'll never leave you or forsake you. In most cases in life, Many times, the ending can be very sad. It depends. It depends on choices. Do you remember when Jesus said, I guess I sum it up this way, do you remember when Jesus went to the cross in his seven statements, there's seven I am statements from the cross in Jesus, in one of those statements, Jesus makes his declaration, totelestai. Jesus says, it's finished. Did you hear him? He said, it's finished. He didn't say, you're finished. He didn't say, I'm finished. He said, it's finished. The end had come. The end of what? The end of sin reigning over a human's life has been broken. It's finished. No longer does sin have to pull the strings in your life. It's finished. He broke the bond that Satan had on humanity. What Adam and Eve plunged us into, Jesus redeemed us from. And when he said that from the cross, totelestai, it means as we get the word telemetry or teleonomic, I'm sending this message. Here it goes. Boom, it's finished. I paid for the sin of all mankind and I send mankind my righteousness. And he dismissed his spirit, the Bible says, and he died there on the cross. What a God. His purpose gives answers. And he's awesome. Beautiful. John 7, verse 37. Excuse me, John 5, verse 37. John 5, 37. And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor has seen his form. But you do not have his word abiding in you. He's speaking to the religious Pharisees. Because whom he sent, you do not believe. You search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. So you're a scholar, PhD, masters in divinity. Big deal, Jesus is saying. So you belong to some sect, some group, some religious movement. Big deal. You search the scriptures and you think in them you have eternal life. But look what he says. These are they which do testify of me. But you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. What a statement. Everything you read about the Bible is about the Christmas Christ. His return 2,000 years ago was to redeem mankind. And then... Thirdly, under point number two today, is the purpose of his return. It's a purpose that cannot be altered. Jeremiah chapter 31. You guys okay? Yes. Jeremiah 31 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and lead, to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a hus husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. By the way, I'd like to insert this just for CNN's sake. Uh, Jeremiah, so we're talking to, we're talking like 2,700 years ago. And we're reading about Israel 2,700 years ago. Just, just for the record. Okay, um, just for CNN uh, and Newsweek. Um, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, that I will put my law in their minds and I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor. This is cool. Every man, uh, his brother, saying, know the Lord, for they all will know me. <laughs> From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Thus says the Lord who gives the sun, watch this, 
This is for all the replacement theology knuckleheads that are out there today that have become very popular all of a sudden on the news circuit. This is what God's word says to them. Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for a light by day and ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who uh, disturbs the sea and its waves roaring. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. And in other words, with what's going on right now in the news, Israel will never cease from being a nation again, no matter what the UN decides, or Joe Biden, or anybody else. Israel, God says, when I bring them back, they're not going to go away. Genesis 9, verse 9. Was that political? <laughs> Genesis 9, verse 9. And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. That's a long time. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 10. Isaiah 54, 10. For the mountain shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has mercy upon you. Church, third and final point is this. It's the proclamation of his return. It's the proclamation of his return. I've already given you a hint, by the way, earlier, and uh, it's kind of a trick question. It kind of goes like this. When was the first time the gospel was ever preached? Remember what I said? You're an expert in this now. It's Genesis 3.15. And that predates, by the way, watch this, it's kind of cool, watch. God speaks to Moses by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God gives Moses the first five books called the Pentateuch. Five, the first five books of the Bible. Within the first five books of the Bible, God speaks to Moses from the moment of creation, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, all the way through on out to Joshua or to the end of Genesis. Check this out. God is giving the message about redemption in Genesis 3.15. Later on comes Abraham. Did Abraham and Moses ever meet each other? Not a once. In fact, you know what? I wrote it down. They were separated by 437 years. And God declared Abraham righteous by his faith. God told Abraham he was righteous before he was circumcised. God told Abraham he was righteous before Moses was ever born. 80 years later, after Moses' birth, the Ten Commandments is given. Do you see... If you put legalism in front of salvation, you're messed up. But if you put salvation in front of legalism, you'll understand rightly. The law is to drive you to Christ. Salvation is available to all who respond to the proclamation of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that if you would believe on him, you would not perish, but you would have everlasting life. Absolutely awesome. It's incredible. The promises of God predate Moses' authorship. Believe, trust, a proclamation that there's a heaven. In Luke chapter 2, verse 4, Luke 2, 4, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, the house of bread. Of course, the house of bread. <laughs> Jesus is the bread of life. He's got to be born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. Because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes. We read this a moment ago. And laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. We read that a moment ago. Listen to this. When that announces in verse 10, do not be afraid, the angel said, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. This announcement, church family, is the proclamation, the announcement that what transpired 2,000 years ago in the fields of Bethlehem was heaven's deposit. It was, so to speak, the ladder that 
let down to earth that you and I might have access. Secondly, it's the message. It's a proclamation that there's a message that you and I have to proclaim. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary, by the way, Matthew's a Jew. This is important. Matthew Levi, or Levi is his name. Mary was betrothed to Joseph or engaged before they came together. She was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Div engagements had to be divorced. You could only break an engagement then through divorcement. And if you were immoral during the engagement, you were stoned to death. Joseph loves her, knows that she's pregnant, doesn't understand how this happened, doesn't believe, doesn't know. And so he's trying to get her out of town without her being murdered or, or uh, executed for breaking the moral law. Man, what a place for him to be in also. But while he thought about these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. You know, he'd love to do that today, right? Not only you, but the Jewish people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall conceive with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took him uh, to his wife and did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name, this is um, amazing, Joseph called his name Jesus. Jesus. God is our salvation. Finally, right here. It's a proclamation of his return and the proclamation, there's a way. What you and I are going to do in wishing people a Merry Christmas or a Happy Christmas, we need to push the envelope this year, friends. Every time, every time, push it a little bit more. Let's get to the point. Let's in, the, in the business world, let's close the deal. Yeah. What do you mean? This is what we're going to do. You know, that kind of thing. Here's what we've been skating around the whole time. We've been flirting out and about the circle. Let's go to the middle of it all. Let's land this plane. The proclamation is all about a way. In Luke 1, verse 1, it says, And as much as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those from the beginning were eyewitness, eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you in orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, this is the guy that hired him to write this out, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Now in the sixth month of the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Is there a Galilee? Is there a city called Nazareth? To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. Was there a Joseph of the house of David? Was there a David? The virgin's name was Mary. Was there ever a Mary? And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. When she saw him, she was troubled at the saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. <laughs> so polite. She, what, it, what probably happened was, what? <laughs> but you know, King James is like, she, she pondered, the, considered the meaning of it. <laughs> <laughs> then the angel said to her, see, watch, I'm see, he, the angel. He's going to back me up on this. Don't be afraid. Why? Because she was afraid. Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest. Yikes. Wow. And the Lord God will give him the throne 
of his father David. Friends and family, listen carefully. That's never happened. Did you know that? He's never sat on the throne of David. Jesus right now is not sitting on the throne of David. Ask yourself, when in the New Testament do you find Jesus sitting on the throne of David? It's never happened. Don't worry about it. His return is when it happens. He has to sit on the throne. Where's the throne of David? Jerusalem. Where's that? Israel. Why do you think it's in the headlines all the time? Satan hates it. Satan's not stupid. He can read the Bible. He knows the Bible better than we do. He knows if there's an Israel, then there's going to be a Jerusalem. And if there's a Jerusalem, then there's the place and the point where the Messiah returns to. Can't have that. So let's make the UN. No, really. Come on. I can prove it. Here's your homework. What, what nation has been condemned by the United Nations more than any other nation on the face of the earth in all of history? Because Satan works there. It's Satan's play. That's his church. The UN stands for the United Nothing or the Unnecessary. But not to Satan. It's a big tool for him. It's a fantastic thing. And don't worry about it. You're paying for it all. Uh, you guys, we pay for like 80% of it. It's a tragedy. It, it's a mess. But Jesus will come back and sit on the throne of David, verse 32, and here it is. And he, verse 33, will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's stand, church. Let's stand. <laughs> Father, wow. Lord, I know we're here right now. I know you came back then, and you walked in the cool of the garden with Adam and with Eve. They threw away your authority. Tried it on their own. Didn't go so well. Then you came to be like us without sin, to qualify in human skin to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. You die on the cross. You're resurrected from the dead for our salvation and justification. And it's up to us now, at this time anyway, for the last 2,000 years, to proclaim the everlasting gospel truth. That if you repent of your sins, that has changed your mind about your life and admit the fact that you need God, repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. If you believe that, then you can look forward with this anticipation, his coming again. Oh, my friends, Christmas is about his coming to save the world. And he's coming back just as he came before. Be ready to meet him. Could be any day now. But regardless of when, know him now. By calling out to him, he will hear your cry. And all of God's people cried out and said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Merry Christmas.